welcome uh, everybody. Delighted you could join us for the sixth annual Jim Green Memorial Lecture. We'll be introducing Tanya's sermon later. He'll be speaking on the future of social innovation. My name is Adam Johal. I'm director of SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement. I wanted to begin by recognizing that we're on the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh peoples. And uh, here to uh, welcome us, I'd like to introduce uh, Deborah Sparrow, who was born and raised on the Musqueam Reserve. She's self-taught in Salish design and jewelry making. Her work can be seen in various museums and institutions. She's an acclaimed weaver who's been deeply involved with the revival of Musqueam weaving. Her Musqueam blankets are displayed at the Vancouver Airport and at UBC. So please uh, welcome Deborah Sparrow. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, on behalf of my chief, Wayne Sparrow, who, yes, shares the same last name as me because he's my brother. He's not my husband. I'm still looking. <laughs> uh, but he's my younger brother, and he's chief, and I taught him everything he knows. That's why he is chief, since it's International Women's Day tomorrow. Yeah, so on behalf of him, and on behalf of my council and my community, but mostly on behalf of my ancestors, for which we all exist. You know, I hope we never forget that because when I drive into the city, and some of you may have heard me before, and I'm gonna continue saying it, I just can't even believe that we actually even lived here. I don't even know sometimes where we're going like to welcome our friend Tanya, or Tonya, uh, to be here from Toronto, am I right? And all of the big cities throughout Canada and the small, to always remember your roots. Always remember the first people that were here. The ones who are responsible and were responsible for the way in which we grew in this land. And as I mentioned, it's so hard to believe when I approach the city that we had villages here at one time. Um, my friend mentioned that I'm a weaver and I am. I'd like to invite each and every one of you to come and visit me at the museum. I'm there on Wednesdays and Fridays from 11 to 3. And I'm actually building a beautiful blanket that reflects the history of our people in connection with the blankets that we've brought home here back to Vancouver from all over Europe that were collected here over 200 years ago. So we've been honored to have them here. They'll continue to be here till April 14th. And I think it just gives you and we share with you the ancient part of this city. And I'm gonna be working hard this summer with some other people doing some innovative things that are not just about textiles, but about how we, how we look at our city how can we bring just a little bit of who we are into the city? And I always said I wouldn't stop until I wrapped the city of Vancouver in my blankets. And it may not be a blanket, but it will be a pattern. So that when you come here, you will know that there were people here who were living and designing and creating with their intelligent ways, 500,000 We've been here 9,600 years to date. So we're an ancient city, and we share that with you, Vancouver. We hold our hands up to say, meet us equally on our own terms and our own land. So we have a lot of work to do, and we're working, and with everything that's happened with reconciliation, I'm not sure sometimes if we even know what are our steps towards reconciliation. We're gonna be working on that. I don't think we should have an answer tomorrow but we'll continue to work and we'll continue to strive towards an understanding. And I have to say that I always like to hold my hands up a little because when we had the march last year, we had over, I think one of the biggest people in the march, uh, numbers of people. So it shows that Vancouver is paying attention and it's gonna take time for all of Canada to understand. And I'm not gonna, I didn't celebrate the 150 years last year because I felt like it wasn't time yet since we have been for thousands of years, I don't know if I can celebrate 150, but I know you all did, and you had reasons to. 
So with that, I would just like to end tonight by sharing just a nice little beautiful poem. Let me see if I can remember, if I can memorize it. From our late chief, Dan George, from the Slay with Tooth, on behalf of the Musqueam, Squamish, and the Slay with Tooth, we're all related. We're all family. We all live in this territory. So may the stars carry your sadness away. May the flowers fill your heart with beauty. May hope forever wipe away, away your tears. But above all, may silence make us strong. So you must all be strong because you're all pretty silent. Yeah. <laughs> so enjoy your evening. I'm going to take, I have to take off right now. I have another, something else to go to. But I wish you good words and I wish you good evening. Hi, Kassia, on behalf of all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Deborah. I'm delighted that you could uh, all uh, be here. Uh, uh, Jim Green was uh, not only a mentor of mine, uh, but a friend uh, as well. And in fact, I can remember when the provincial government bought the Woodward's building from the developer and having a glass of bourbon with him at his government offices at uh, Pender and Howe. He mentored so many people, particularly university students, so it's great to be here at SFU to host this event uh, every year. And I do want to thank uh, our partners, uh, uh, besides uh, our office, SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement, uh, Van City Credit Union, SFU Public Square that did a phenomenal jo job uh, putting on the, the uh, Future of Work uh, Summit, uh, SFU Radius, Sean Smith is uh, here, the LED Lab, thank you to Curie Bird, uh, and also there's a great team of people who have been inspired by the Centre for Social Innovation uh, here that are working on the repurposing of the police station at 312 Main Street, the person leading the charge on that many years ago and still there today. Bob Williams is uh, with us today. I want to uh, also recognize Alexandra Rutherford, Jean Blishen from the Van City Community Foundation Board, Mauro Vicera, Derek Chet, the ED of the Van City Community Foundation. There's staff here from there as well, Ashley Proctor, Vanessa Richards, Iris Young, Thomas Bevan, who's worked on it for many years, and also thank you to my uh, staff here in the office, Fiorella Pineos, Melissa Roach, and Jamie Lee Gonzalez, who do uh, incredible work uh, every day. Um, uh, next, I'd like to invite up, uh, representing the Jim Green Foundation, and also Jim's daughter, Alexandra Rutherford, to share a few words. Thank you, Em. And uh, on behalf of uh, the Jim Green Foundation, we've got Bob Williams, Mauro Vicera here amongst us tonight. I just want to thank you for being here. This is our sixth annual uh, Jim Green Memorial Lecture. And we are here tonight because Jim had a vision. It's about 15 years ago that he had uh, the pleasure of visiting Tanya Sermon, visiting her Centre for Social Innovation in Toronto, and honestly was inspired by the work that she has created and continues to create there. Jim had gone to Bologna and had learned about um, the principles of working cooperatively and breaking down silos and sharing space and working together. And those were all the things that he saw Tanya Sermon had been able to embody and, um, and I guess harness for the sake of and for the purpose of social change and social impact and social justice. And so he came back to Vancouver and said to Bob Williams, we have to do this in Vancouver and in particular in the downtown east side. This is something that has to exist in Vancouver. And Bob, I need you to figure out how to make it happen. <laughs> and I think Bob sat on that for a few years. Um, and about six years ago, brought us together uh, a really powerful team. Uh, we've been supported by the Vance City Community Foundation, Vance City, um, and the City of Vancouver to make it happen. So it's been uh, an uphill battle, I won't say the contrary, but uh, the Centre for the Vancouver version of the Centre for Social Innovation and Inclusion um, that is housed at 312 Main Street is uh, very excited to say just a few short weeks away from opening its doors finally so well done to everybody who's been involved everyone here i encourage you to come and visit us once the doors are open bring your laptop bring a friend enjoy a coffee and uh, you'll see what the magic is all about 
Um, so just thank you, Tanya, for being here tonight. You'll hear from her um, what her inspiration was for her work um, and the involvement interactions she's had with Jim. Um, we had the pleasure of touring her in, on site earlier today and uh, in the three year span since she last saw the center, um, I'm sure she'll share with you her, her thoughts and uh, uh, ideas on how far we've taken it and there's still more work to be done for sure. But um, enjoy, enjoy the talk tonight. Thank you for being here. Brief word on the, the format tonight. Uh, after Tanya speaks, we're not going to be doing a traditional Q&A, but we're inviting all, all of you to come to the World Arts Centre on the second floor for a reception where you'll be able to speak with Tanya directly. That'll be going on until uh, 10 p.m. So please don't leave afterwards. Come and join us uh, in the World uh, Arts Centre. And before I introduce Tanya, who's a social entrepreneur with a passion for bringing life to world-changing projects, who's been leading social ventures since 1987. She's the founding CEO of the Center for Social Innovation. How many of you have been to the Center for Social Innovation in Toronto? Can you put up your hands for a second? Wow. So about a, a quarter. Okay. We're going to start with a, a video that features the Center for Social Innovation. We're going to invite Tanya up after that. So with our friends in the booth. <laughs> and delighted to be here tonight. It's um, coming to Vancouver is just like it just it tickles me and the um, the message that I'm, I'm bringing tonight I feel a little disingenuous because I actually have so many mentors and partners and and uh, and, and gurus in the audience here tonight that I think would be infinitely more qualified to deliver this talk. However, I'm going to give it a shot. Um, I am uh, going to use my glasses too because it's uh, it's it's the thing that has to happen yeah. nowadays. <laughs> so Anne asked me to come here tonight to speak about uh, the future of social innovation. And I guess before I start, how many people would describe themselves as social entrepreneurs? How many people here would uh, describe themselves as a social innovator? How many people would describe themselves as an activist? Ah, uh, how about how many people here would say that they probably more align with social innovation or social justice? Okay, awesome. This is going to be fun. Um, as you can see from the video, uh, CSI is about unbridled optimism. We've created a space that is built around solutions, hope, and possibility. We've also been squarely criticized for being having too many for-profits and therefore not nearly pure enough, too many charities and therefore not realistic or grounded enough. We've been described as commie HQ, a bastion of political correctness, and we've been described as sellouts who, who can't understand, and they would, people can't understand why in God's name we would work with those people. This has been one of the most interesting journeys of my life. Looking at how we understand the space between social innovation and social justice. Tonight I'm hoping to take you down what has been a rather painful relationship that I've had in the space between these two ideologies. Many years ago, we made the decision at the Center for Social Innovation to change our tagline from where change happens to it's up to us. And this was my first dig at the us versus them thinking of social justice. But I'm going to go back to the beginning, the very beginning, to give you a bit of a sense of where I come from. I was raised by a conspiracy theory spinning, pyramid marketing scheme, poverty stricken, hippie father in the 70s. <laughs> I learned how to meditate, compost, steal, and close a deal all before the age of 10. My mom was gone, and dad was at his mildest 
anti-establishment. I was the epitome of pull up your bootstraps and have listened to my dad complain about every system that exists in the world. Whether it was the man, the system, the Rockefellers, or the Illuminati, or maybe it was the aliens and the greys that are coming down to invade our country and our, and our world. I grew under this, uh, this um, in, uh, with him to become so profoundly frustrated with whining and complaining, right? It was always the system's fault. And I found in that space that I couldn't be more powerless. When it's always the system's fault, where do we exist? Where do we draw our power from? I got out of that house as soon as I possibly could, found myself in university, and proceeded to get schooled in the ways of colonization, feminism, mutually assured destruction, fascism, capitalism, and sustainability. The backdrop was the Cold War, and the Earth Summit was just barely an idea. But at university, I had found my passion. Thus began my journey, my struggle. I was going to save the world. Anybody else? I started my young career working on acid rain, climate change, air quality, and was really mesmerized by the idea of cooperatives. And every time I would approach an issue, and a community of activists that I wanted to work with, I would find myself feeling alienated. They were so smart. They used such big language that, to be honest, I really didn't know and understand. And they were so, so angry. They could look at a policy and see exactly what was missing. I would look at the same policy and I would think, wow, this looks good. I just didn't have the same critical thinking skills that so many of the activists had. And I realized that activism was truly an inhospitable environment for an optimist such as myself. And there was this niggling thing that I had inside me, truthfully, when I was speaking to myself, when I wasn't trying to speak the language of social justice. There was this crazy idea that I had that maybe markets could be used for good and not evil. But this idea was heresy, and I would never have dared speak it out loud. I remember one of my first jobs. I was hired as a sales coordinator, but nobody in the nonprofit sector could accept that language or would give me a meeting. And so I had to return my title an outreach coordinator just to meet with people. I was selling something people had no idea about. It was called the internet. <laughs> Quickly, I discovered that I was an entrepreneur, although at the time, I sure as heck didn't know it. I felt in my heart that we needed to reconcile these worldviews. We needed to find a way to harness the power of markets, the power behind capitalism, that self-interest, and align it with our values, social values, to achieve collective impact. And so I started. I, I didn't know any better. I started my first nonprofit. It was called Earth Shoppers. I was going to shop my way to a better planet. <laughs> it failed. I started the Global Development Network at U of T, Walk Your Talk Publications. Again, both failed. And then at EcoEd Web Networks and being a co founder of Rabble.ca, I was in the frontline role with campaigners, unions, cooperatives, journalists, super, super smart, smart people, and so, so angry. These experiences took me more deeply into doubt about social justice. So many meetings, so many arguments, insular, theor uh, theoretical arguments. The messaging became vague and washed down, backstabbing, attacking each other instead of the issues, easily we were so easily ignored by the system. They had a nice, neat box for activists. You could just put them over there and let them fight amongst themselves, and we didn't have to, nobody had to really deal with us. But what happened in me was so profoundly personal. I was becoming exhausted. My body 
was full of anger and rage. I was becoming experienced at being able to rip apart a policy and rip apart a project and be critical, mean, and nasty, and I could feel it in my body. My spirit was drained, and I found myself gaining weight and getting sick. Perhaps the hardest part of this was this idea of them. Sometimes the them was government, sometimes it was corporations, sometimes it was the system, often it was capitalism. It was almost always outside of ourselves. So we were constantly fighting, either with each other or with them. And it came to me, who is them? Who's them? Who's running the system? I started to look behind those things and I found people, real people, who were confused, sometimes uneducated, sometimes had different values than what I had. But there were real people behind those systems and they were feeling as frustrated as I was on the outside. <coughs> so okay. then, I couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore. I didn't feel welcome. I felt drained. And I decided to sell out. At least there was a chance of my own happiness. I figured, screw it. I can't save the world after all. It's gone too far anyway. The earth will heal itself when we're all gone. It'll serve us right. <laughs> and you know, sometimes I have to hold that negative view to remember our real place in this world. The earth is going to do just fine after we're all gone. Let me tell you, it may take a few thousand years, but it'll be fine. I sold out and I took a breath. Activism was making me feel powerless. And I was also starting to realize who I was. What were my skills? What were my gifts? And how could I better put these skills and talents to use? I was starting to realize that I was a builder, not a fighter. I was good at making things. I was no longer welcome in the fighting circle, so I started to build new circles. The community garden that we started was with women who were 20 and 30 years my senior. They were really nice. <laughs> the daycare that we, the, day, the cooperative daycare that we formed with parents who had probably disagreed with their politics. We raised a, a village of kids together without having necessarily the same political viewpoints. I started to build communities, I started to build initiatives, and I started to build collaborations, and I started to thrive. Building things gave me energy, and it connected me to real people, and I could connect to them around a creative process, a healthy process, where I could be whole, and I could see them for all of who they were. I could see how we were wasting our energy fighting with one another instead of creating alternatives, and I could see that the world desperately needed alternatives. And so at that point, somewhere in there, I made a commitment that I was going to make social change and have fun doing it. I would seek a quality life filled with joy and laughter and relationships, and I would do my little part to make the world better. I somehow in there decided that how we worked was probably more important than what we were working on. I went on to build collabor a collaborative that was responsible for getting the ban on bisphenol A in baby bottles. I worked on the development of the Ontario Nonprofit Network that connected over 40,000 nonprofits across the province of Ontario. And I started the Centre for Social Innovation, creating a home and a community for thousands of solutions creators, a mecca of hope and possibility, creating solutions, building new enterprises, enriching our communities, and creating an amazing sense of belonging. We were embracing markets, we were embracing social values, we were creating alternatives to capitalism. It was all going so damn well. New language, social innovation, words that speak of experimentation and creativity and collaboration and systems change. What could go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? And then the world smacked me in the face. Donald Trump, reconciliation, 
and my incredible naivete around this issue. The reality of Syrian refugees, the pipelines going through your incredible province, gun violence, and the Me Too campaign. All of these things and so many others came washing down. What in God's name were we really doing about these issues? Was social innovation just bullshit? Were we a bunch of frauds? Are the criticisms of social innovation true? That we are mostly white, privileged, champagne socialists who talk a good game, have all the time in the world to just ponder solutions, but that we aren't grappling with the reality that's really happening on the ground? The first National Social Innovation Conference was held in November in Toronto last year. Among other things, a showdown between these two ideologies took place. The social innovation sector, uh, where did that go? Social innovation was confronted with anger, outrage, and dismissal by activists. They were pissed. And this brought me full circle. What do we need to do to embrace the best of both? How can we model the world that we want and still work in the world that is? How do we hold the space between these two ideas? And how do we make social change and not lose ourselves to it? So, spoiler alert, I have no idea how all this is going to go down. <laughs> like, really, none. Social innovation is slow, compromising, incremental, and sometimes involves dancing with something or someone that you feel may be the devil. It seems a lot to leave um, these structures in place. But social innovation, and social innovation is also about the tensions. These, often these tensions can be constructive and creative. But what is social innovation anyway? One of the things that happened at the conference, the Spark conference, that was so interesting was that I came away thinking, I have a pretty good idea of what the practice of social justice involves, but I'm not sure we as a sector have any real sense of what the practice of social innovation really involves. How do we, oh, where did I go? Here we go. So, uh, the thing about the social innovation sector, which is so fascinating, is it's still so very new. It's an approach that's still defining itself, still figuring out who it is and what we believe. A field that is still, I'm afraid, afraid to stand up for what it believes in. So here's what I know social innovation to be right now and what I believe I think are some of the threads that can help us to understand this practice. Social innovation in, in my opinion, refers to the creation, development, adaptation, adoption, adaptation, and integration of new and renewed concepts, systems, and practices that put people and planet first. And those words, people and planet first, are perhaps the most important ones. We know that social innovation is a practice that speaks about systems lenses whole systems that allows us to be able to look at an entire ecosystem and to be able to consider and thoughtfully reflect the complexities which are inherent in those systems. We know that so social innovators develop a practice to recognize patterns. We see patterns, we see connections, and we do see histories, and we look for those histories to reveal those patterns. Social innovation is also collaborative and cross-sectoral by nature, which means that we have no choice but to work with people who may not share our values, but rather have a shared interest in the change that we're trying to achieve in the world. Social innovation is about experimentation and risk-taking, and it's also about building a reflective practice where we can be authentic and vulnerable about what we know and about what we don't know. Social innovation is certainly asset-based and opportunistic. We like to start from what we already have, and we like to see where those opportunities are emerging and jump on them. 
Social innovation is also about generative relationships. At its base, there is a fundamental belief that people are fundamentally good and that we have an opportunity to work with each other in developing a generative relationship. Social innovation is also adaptive. It can change and evolve with the partners and players in the room. And gratefully, it is also ridiculously creative work. Super, super creative. In social innovation, we believe that social transformation flows from personal transformation. We also believe that you change the world when you hold up a new and more attractive way to live. Ah, ode to the alternatives. Here's what social innovation has not been good at, in my humble opinion. Social innovation has been afraid, in the name of collaboration, to stand up for what we believe and say people and planet come first. The economy, the government, the systems, the culture, they're second. We must, we must stand up and put people and planet first. Number two, we must build a movement which is inclusive. Definitions of social innovation which are so limiting as to exclude people because only social innovators are working on the systems change. It doesn't serve us. We need everybody to be a part of the solution. All of the assets, all of their skills, all of their creativity. We need all of it to be working towards a new way of, of being. So this movement has to be more inclusive. And that means we may need to slow down in order to speed up. And this is one that I admit that I'm learning about too. This third thing that I believe social innovation needs to be. We need to decolonize social innovation. We need to learn from all of our ancestors, all of our social movements, and all of the history and experiences that, have, that are gifted to us through the social justice movements and so many more to begin to own and understand how, why and how we are here and how we got here and how we can move forward together. The process of decolonization is something that I'm just beginning to open my eyes to. And it's a long journey ahead. And I know that I'm not the only one who needs to move forward in this way. We have so much to learn about this work. And we will make so many mistakes. Social innovation asks us to be gentle with one another. To be forgiving of one another. Social innovation also gives us, with some exciting new delights, social innovation gives us possibility. It gives us the space to not get caught and trapped in our limited box, but rather to think creatively and think with others outside the box to imagine new ways of doing things. Social innovation gifts us the power of relationship. Oh, this is a sideline off my talk, but there you go. It's the first, I think it's the first one I am, so I think we'll be okay. <laughs> I just, last year, I had the incredible, incredible privilege of being able to take a sabbatical. And a sabbatical, at least for me, after 14, 15 years of building CSI, was much, much needed. Um, and it was almost like a forced existential crisis. You know, it was like a planned existential crisis where you get this opportunity to really reflect on who you are and why you do the work that you do. And I've, um, you know, I've had a spiritual practice, as I said, since, since I was a little girl, my dad really did teach me how to meditate. And so I, of course, went, I went full woo, uh, uh, what is it, like full hippie. I went full hippie on my, uh, on my sabbatical and I was meditating and I was doing all my work and trying to do all of my catch up work. And, you know, I came to this, um, how many people have read this beautiful book called, uh, oh shoot. Oh, it's old. I'm an old person. It's a brain thing. It's, 
The Meaning of Life by, um, help me out here, Darcy. Victor yes, Victor Frankl. What's it called? Man's Search for Meaning. Excellent. How many people have read that? Yeah, okay. So that book got me so going, right? Mm -hmm. I started searching and searching and searching. And when it all boiled down to it, I came up with my own, my own kind of worldview here, which is that there's only really three things that we aspire to as humans. Joy, relationship, and meaning. Joy, relationship, and meaning. And the beautiful thing about social innovation is it offers us all of those three. It's like sparkly, juicy awesomeness where we get to play with one another. We get to be creative with one another and we get to feel alive and useful and we get to feel powerful because the things that we're creating give us joy, give us life-affirming energy, and give us the energy to keep going. Social innovation also gives us spirituality and the opportunity to begin a journey of personal transformation. And ultimately, it gives us a sense of hope that the work that we're doing really will pay off. When I have, um, in our work at the Center for Social Innovation, I have an incredibly privileged position to be able to work with some of the most remarkable agents of change that I think this country has ever seen. Whether it's Mayan Ziv, who built, uh, I'm gonna get access now, okay, wait a second, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna butcher the name of her organization, she'd be very upset, oh, it's gone. <laughs> it's gone. Um, but she does this amazing project where she crowdsources wheelchair accessibility across, uh, around the world. Just an amazing young woman, okay, I really did lose all of my others. Um, you know, our very own Adil Dalla launched a How to Be an Ally series in Toronto and has begun a series of conversations that are deep conversations that are all about social justice and social innovation. And then I come to this incredible city, your amazing city here in Vancouver, and have the privilege of being taken on a tour of 312 Main Street. And I have to say, there is one of the most ambitious and profound embodiments of the, of the integration, the vision of an integration between social innovation and social justice. Walking into the main floor of 312 Main Street today really, really was an amazing and remarkable experience. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna describe it because I don't wanna take away the joy that you will have, but all I can say is that the grandmother in that building is welcoming you. It's, uh, it's a testament to the possibility and the potential when we're able to make decisions that really do embody our values, all of our values, and still bring a sense of hope and possibility. We have an incredible opportunity to bring creativity, collaboration, and entrepreneurship into our work as activists. I'm holding those two together. Not at the expense of analysis or the realities that we're facing. Far from it. To do this work, to do good social innovation work, we will need a profound depth of understanding. We will need deep empathy, a clear analysis of power and privilege. We will need to be honest and authentic. And we will make mistakes, lots of them, and we'll grow and we'll forgive each other from time to time. And we will need to share power, but we will do this because we have cast a vision that is so compelling that we will want to share power. So what is the future of social innovation? It must be an embrace of both social justice and social innovation. We have an opportunity to embrace all of the tools. Yes, we need to do our homework and, sh and share, ensure that we have a solid analysis. We need to embrace all of the perspectives, even the ones we don't like. We need to model a world that we want in every decision that we make 
and in every exchange that we have with another human. We need to cast a vision of where we're going so that others can join us. We need to call out our broken systems and then we need to work together to build better ones. And we do need to take new and bigger risks and forgive each other when we fall down and we don't succeed, us versus them. That's the illusion. We do. That's the trap. That's the box that we get caught inside of. The magic of social innovation is that we all have power to be able to be co-creators of a better world in a way that allows us to flourish and shine. In my version of the future of social innovation, it really is up to us. Thank you so much, uh, Tanya. It gives us a lot to think about, but this evening is only half over because it's mandatory that you come to the reception on the second floor. And we will also have Vanessa Richards and the Woodward's Community Singers joining us there as well. So, congratulations.